Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today we are welcoming Mr. Jerry Robinson of FollowTheMoney.com. Jerry has been around since the 1990s. He has a very unique perspective into the markets and ways to trade the most volatile and speculative industries out there, the cryptos and cannabis. He is also very adamant about the debt which has been incurred by the United States government and the officials there who seem to be continuing to let our country's deficit run wild. Jerry is an expert economist and a best-selling author. We have created a profile with an exclusive report about him at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Jerry, which covers his extraordinary achievements. Jerry, welcome to the show. How are you today? It's great to be here. Thank you, Michelle. It's, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you. We are excited. We want to get your perspective about several different global topics and then here in the United States. So it's going to be interesting. Absolutely. Look forward to it. We're going to start off with the global economy. Do you foresee what people are referring to as a reset or a financial jubilee? Do you believe that we are reaching that this looks like Rome at the end of its tenure moment? <laughs> well, certainly. Uh, I think as you look at the global economy, you see absolute extreme levels of debt. I mean, anyone, you know, you don't have to be an economist, you know, to see that uh, the writing is on the wall. What's really interesting, and maybe we'll just take a look at history just momentarily, is, to, is you bring up the word jubilee, which is very interesting uh, language because, uh, that is a concept that goes way back, uh, all the way back to the, you know, to the Bible, to the, very, uh, to the ancient uh, Jewish writings. And the concept was, was that uh, you know, at some point, every 50 years in this case, you would eliminate all debt holding. I mean, in other words, people who owed debt, that'd be wiped clean. The slates were, were wiped clean. And that kind of concept today is absolutely abhorrent to the, you know, to the money changers and uh, to, the, to the monetary uh, system that we have today. So um, I think that that's something that the, the, the global um, leaders would certainly want to avoid. Uh, when we talk about a reset, I think there's a lot of, of um, uh, um, ideas that are pregnant within that concept, not all of which I would subscribe to. In other words, I'm not so certain uh, that we're going to see necessarily a global economic reset uh, that is that that inspires the crash, but instead perhaps uh, required in the in the awake uh, of of such a crash. You know, I think right now we find ourselves in a situation where uh, we are caught by our own philosophies. Um, there is a belief, I think, among man that progress is inevitable. That everything must continue to progress and that man has to get better all the time and technology has to improve all of the time. And while that all sounds fine on paper, when you start thinking about how to finance that progress, suddenly we, we have found ourselves turning to things like usury or interest. And interestingly enough, I mean, I, I find this to be interesting. Maybe your audience doesn't find this particularly interesting, but, but I, I certainly do. And your, your word again, Jubilee triggered this in my mind, but you know, for the first, oh, for the last uh, 500 years, uh, we have seen the use of interest. And when you use interest to create a monetary system, you are inevitably creating inequities. Uh, and you're, you're creating a, a level of inequality that is just uh, simply staggering. And that's what we've seen today, the inequality that has been created. But if you go back, for example, I mean, many, many people point to America and they say, well, you know, uh, many point and say, well, we think it's a Christian nation or we think it's a, you know, has some sort of Christian background. Well, what's interesting is, is for the first 1500 years of the Christian church, usury was considered a mortal sin. It was a sin that if you committed, I mean, you might as well commit murder. I mean, you know, uh, lending at interest was against the church. It was something that was clearly against the church. Even guys like Martin Luther and John Calvin were like, you can't lend money, especially Martin Luther, you can't lend money at interest. So it's, it's kind of ironic that we have built this, this system now, uh, this illusion of prosperity that is all dependent upon interest. It really could not have been manufactured without interest. And so we have created this kind of noose for ourselves through this excessive amount of borrowing, this excessive amount of consumption that has all been enabled by this world of usury. 
And now we find ourselves kind of hamstrung by it. I mean, take the United States, for example, which is now on track, Michelle, to spend more uh, in the next two or three years on interest on the national debt than they spend on large amounts of defense spending. I mean, we spend a lot of money on defense spending. But fairly soon in the next few years, according to the Wall Street Journal report, recent Wall Street Journal report, we're going to be spending more on the interest on the national debt. I mean, it's, it, we live in a very unsustainable time and also a time of great deceit. Uh, and so as far as going back to your original question about reset and jubilee, I think we are inevitably going to, to hit a brick wall. We're, we're racing right now, as it were, right towards a brick wall or right towards a, 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 towards a, a cliff. And there is no political will, Michelle, to stop it. Uh, there is no president that has a desire to stand in front of the public and say, we're going to slash spending on all of these different uh, government programs because people are going to vote him out. There's no senator that wants to stand up and say, we are going to rein in spending on X, Y, Z because those interest groups will throw him out. So in other words, there's really no, uh, there's really no way for the political will, if it even existed, to actually manifest because we now are, we find ourselves strangled by interest groups, lobbyists, uh, and others that will fight any kind of of cutting of the spending at all. So it's just literally just going to at some point have to explode. I wrote a book called Bankrupts. I wrote a book called Bankruptcy of Our Nation back in 2009 and we revised it in 2012. And it was really all about this topic. And, but no, I, uh, to kind of paint a grim pic- picture, Michelle, I, I do see a dark outcome, uh, but it's really all due to our own fault of just simply overconsumption, re- uh, building a world based upon leverage, and then kind of having to live with the outcome of that. Wow. Jerry, what has changed in the United States in the past 10 years since the great I guess, the Great Recession of 2008 in terms of leveling the playing field for the average person. In your opinion, is America still the land of opportunity? Because so many people are now saying that retirement is unachievable and that a career path without taking on a very large debt for a college degree is impossible. And in fact, that the middle class is actually almost done for good. Take us back and compare today's United States with 10 years ago. Well, 10 years ago, let's say go back to about 2009, um, there was, uh, except for the dot-com bubble, which I lived through, I learned to trade, by the way, uh, in the late 1990s through the dot-com bubble. And so we lived through that. And I think everyone kind of earmarked that collapse as inevitable. It seemed like, well, you know, the, uh, the dot-com boom and the internet revolution kind of created this froth and then it kind of blew off. And, you know, and then plus we had September 11th, 2001, which shocked the markets as well and shocked the nation. And I think there was a general consensus that, well, things were too frothy there, but that doesn't really stop our upward trend or our upward trajectory, our progress. Everything is still intact. And so the 2000 bubble was not quite Uh, and the bursting of that bubble was not quite the same as the 2008 and 2009 uh, issue. So in 2008 and 2009, we got a nice, and especially by 2008, we got a really good eyeful of the toxic nature of our economy. And we, we really had a really big eyeful of it. And it was the greatest, of course, the greatest crash since the 1929 depression, which was absolutely devastating at the time. And We went through a a similar period of time where people tried to figure out exactly what does this mean? Is America done for, you know, in the 1930s? And it ended up being a war that pulled us out of the funk. And I would suggest to you that that is exactly where we are heading uh, now, is that we find ourselves now in a a place, in in an economy which is unsustainable, as we've already stated. And while individuals are Uh, struggling to make ends meet still. We don't see income equality across the board at all. We've certainly seen a lot of people make a lot of money over the last 10 years from all this QE that went on and all of the different uh, monetary policies that were created as a result of the 2008 crash. 
but it hasn't really trickled down, so to speak, to the average individual. The average individual still finds himself you know, operating at a level where he was many years ago. And it's, it's difficult to get ahead. And he often finds himself one paycheck away from bankruptcy or foreclosure. I mean, the stats are clear. Most people don't even have savings to take them through a period of a six-month layoff or something. So the majority of people are not ready uh, for a, a crash. And I think the mentality of, of the American people is slowly coming to that recognition. I think that you see in, uh, and I don't want to talk politics by any stretch of the imagination. If there's one thing I hate more, I can't think of anything I really Uh despise more than politics. (laughs) That's my next question. (laughs) Oh, no, no, no. (laughs) Well, well, I'm happy to talk about it, but, 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 uh, but I I would prefer not to, but, 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 but to be totally frank with you, I think that people are coming to the realization that America is really on the downtrend is in a, is in a downtrend globally speaking. I mean, I'm, Many people don't realize that the American economy peaked in the 1940s. It was never bigger. The the as far as as far as a uh, total share of global GDP. I mean, we really dominated the globe in the 1940s, 1950s. That was the highest. That was the highest time of the American uh, you know economy. I mean, there was never a time greater. It was the time of Leave It to Beaver. It was the time of you know, Andy Griffith, Mayberry. I mean, there was, a, there was a time of great absolute economic hegemony for the United States. And I think people, you know, really believed that it was just going to continue to rise. It was like, my parents got a bigger house than my grandparents, you know what I mean? And I'm going to have a huge house now and so on and so forth. And they've become, the middle class has become really shocked by the fact that no, you're not. And, and the younger people are actually going out and moving back home because they can't do what their parents did and what their grandparents did. And um, it's just... There is. There's, there's, there's a great readjustment uh, mm-hmm. going on right now in the minds uh, of mm-hmm. people. But, but there's also a recognition that, um, and I think it's a slow recognition. It's been something we've been saying for a long time, but I think it's starting to break through is that people are starting to realize that there are, you know, Americans in particular, are starting to realize that there are other global players who are itching to take our place. Oh, uh, case in point, China. You know, China became the largest global economy in 2014 when you look at GDP PPP, which is the pur- purchasing price per parity uh, and purchasing power parity. And when you look at the GDP by a PPP basis, you'll find that you know, the United States was surpassed in 2014. Now, this is not a metric that economists like to bant about here in the United States. They don't like to brag about the fact that China became larger than us. Yeah, you don't hear that. You really don't. But it's, a, but it's a fact. And we continue to see China breaking records and continuing to get larger. And by the time, you know, maybe probably within a decade from now, we envision that everyone here in the United States will, will come to a full cognizant reality of what's really happening. They will fully understand and digest that while they have been pointing at the office of the presidency and assuming that the president is weak, I mean, we can look back at perhaps President Barack Obama and one of the favorite, uh, one of the favorite ideas and attacks of his adversaries was to point the fact that he was a weak president. Uh, then we've even seen some of that creep in now, even into President Trump, where it seems like There's a lot of things happening globally where he's really, he kind of ran on a ticket of being really strong, like he's the strong man. But even as strong as he appears, we're seeing that he also appears weak in some ways on the global stage. And what we're what we're really kind of pointing at is that over time, we believe Americans are going to realize that it's not the president himself that we choose that is weak or strong. It's actually the office of the presidency. It's actually the country of America that is actually descending relative to the rising economies of the East. There's a great book put out by Gideon Rockman called Easternization. And he was a writer for the Wall Street Journal, I think also for the Financial Times. It's a fantastic case uh, that is built showing that it's simply a matter of math that over time, China will simply overtake the United States. And this is what we see playing out now globally, especially between US and China with the trade deal and everything. This is much deeper than just the latest trade or the latest tariff or the latest issue. It's really about who is going to fundamentally control the 21st century and uh, the economy. And from our perspective, that, that is going to be China. 
And we also know that the United States is not going to go quietly into that dark night. We know that they have a massive military. And we know that in the past, they have used that military to, to get what they want. Uh, it hasn't always been for, you know, uh, for, for, for good purposes. And I think most people are aware of that. We believe that the United States military will be activated again uh, to prevent China from taking over uh, as it is on the trajectory to do. So we see war ahead. We see war particularly between the U.S. and China, and we see it coming underneath a different pretext. It won't be economic war. It never is. Uh, for example, when we went into the Middle East back in uh, the early 2000s, you know, to get Saddam Hussein, it was because of 9-11. Uh, but but uh, of course, everybody knows that's not true. Then we went to Afghanistan, and that was about nine eleven, and you know, and everybody's still scratching their heads as to why that hasn't been resolved. And so, and then we're talking about going into Iran for some reason, which nobody seems to know. So, in other words, like when we do war, it's oftentimes not always for this pure motivation. There's something always underneath. And when you follow the money, which is the name of our website, followthemoney.com, when you follow the money, you tend to get the answers. Um, and so we see uh, war ahead. We see economic calamity ahead. Wow. We, see, we see that people who are going to thrive in this kind of environment are going to be those who understand the new rules of the game. And, and much of what that means is that you cannot put all of your faith, hope, and trust into a J-O-B. I mean, it's good to have a good job. If you have one, that's fantastic. But we believe that even people who have good jobs should also consider creating multiple streams of income. So whether it be you know, buying a piece of affordable real estate or learning a skill of investing in, in volatile times or learning how to trade or whether it's taking on a new income stream maybe with online income. I mean, there's so many different ways that you can, you can create a plan B and many people don't have one. And so I think that's really important. And I'll, I'll go one more step here, Michelle, because I know you have more questions, but one more thing is that I took perhaps an extreme step in my own life. My wife and I were living in uh, Houston, Texas, and we were living in the middle of the city. It was, you know, very, very big city. And I just had a, I had a, had a knowing inside of me that I, at some point uh, back in around 2012, that I needed to leave the city, that I needed to make preparations for my own family, that I needed to have a plan. Because if you get, if you get caught in a major city and there's calamity, or war, or some kind of problem, it's a bad place to be. And so what we did was we up moved out of the city. We moved out into the country. We started getting off of the grid. So we actually are now living in, in the country. We have acreage. We have streams. We have, you know, we have a pond. We have a livestock. You know, we have, uh, we have, uh, we're getting off of the grid even with our heat and our air and our electricity. I mean, we're slowly doing all of that. Why? We're doing it because grocery stores don't make food and because the power, the power structures, uh, literally the, uh, the electric power uh, grids are underneath massive attack through cyber attacks. And we believe that the next realm of war is going to be particularly devastating to the city, to people who live in the city. And so we are taking, we're on guard against that. And I think you don't have to leave the city. Uh, in order to take preparations, you can, you can, you know, prepare in place wherever you are. But I think that that kind of thinking is what uh, motivates us. Uh, we realize that the times are very dangerous and we want to be prepared. Very interesting. So even if you live in the city, just at least have a plan, have somewhere, you know, you can go that is self-sustaining preferably, but if, if not, at least has food and water and Thank Absolutely. And, and for those who are saying, hey, I live in the city, I'd like some you know, recommendations on that or that, that speaks to me. Well, you can go to our website, followthemoney.com forward slash five levels. And there we have a completely free uh, kind of a course that walks you through how we, you know, kind of uh, broke free. It's our five levels of financial freedom. And it shows you how we broke free uh, financially and also how we kind of, you know, got out of the city and what we did. But what you can do if you're living in the city, how you can prepare. Beautiful. So, uh, followthemoney.com forward slash five levels. That's a free, uh, free uh, course there. Excellent. Now comes the question about the president. Just very fast though. How much influence do you think that the president and his administration have overall in the trajectory of the economy? Are demographic trends 
and tech superiority and free market the determining factor, or is it the government? So how much influence does the president really have over the economy? Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. I think that, I think that uh, we live in a faith based economy. Um, and what I mean by that is if you pull out a dollar bill out of your, of your wallet and you look at it, you'll discover that it says federal reserve note, right? So you look at that and you say, well, what does that mean? I mean, it used to say silver certificate. You could take it into the bank and you could get a silver piece of silver instead of this dollar, but now it says federal reserve note. So it's a loan. It's a loan given by who? It's a note. If I, if I say I have a car note, I have a car loan. So I have a federal reserve note. I have a federal reserve loan. I have something on loan from the federal reserve. They're going to get paid back that loan, by the way, and they're going to get paid back with interest. What interest rate are they going to get? The interest rate they set at their, at their uh, meeting. So they, they issue the paper, the funny paper, and then they charge the interest on that funny paper. It's a, it's a scam. It's always been a scam. It's a shell game. But the, the, uh, the point is, is that in that environment, if you're not using anything with intrinsic value, then what are you really basing everything on? You're basing everything upon the full faith and credit of the federal government. So the president's job is to do two things. Number one, his job is to sell military equipment. If you've ever noticed, if you watch the president and you watch anywhere he goes around the world, he's always there to sign a military deal because he is the face of the military industrial complex and he is the the main seller of military weapons around the world. And that is a huge, massive, massive role for the president. He is the face for it. The second role of the president, aside from all of the you know, typical things that we see in the Constitution, the other major role in this, in this faith-based economy is that he has to provide, he has to cheerlead the economy. He has to provide faith in the economy. He cannot uh, act as if you know, uh, everything is going to go wrong. He has to be the cheerleader. And I think President Trump is particularly good at that. He is a very, he knows how to manipulate. He knows how to charm. He knows how to do all of these things. Um, and so I think as long as he displays faith in the economy, that we'll see that continued faith. But if he can, you know, he has a, he has a lot of power and he's a particularly persuasive person, as you well know. I mean, very persuasive. Of course. And so, and so in that, in that case, that's a little dangerous. Uh, you almost want your president to be a little more boring and a little less opinionated uh, because his opinions can have such tremendous power mm -hmm. because of his office. So when it comes, when it really boils down to the economy, I would say that the president unfortunately has more power than we would probably any of us would like because he controls, if you will, the faith in the system, as does the uh, head of the, the chair of the Federal Reserve as does the chief of the U.S. Treasury. So you have these individuals who are strategically placed who their opinions and their words can literally move the markets and move the economy. Um, as far as it being free market and whether that really drives everything, of course, we have uh, what is called a free market. Of course, it's not a free market, and we don't, we don't have free market economy here in the United States at all. It's, it's, quite, it's quite the opposite. It's, it's, a, it's a controlled economy. And, it, and I think most people who have studied the economy you know, quickly grasp that, that the, that the free market is really in name only. It's, it's, uh, it's really controlled by a lot of large uh, multinational corporations that, you know, uh, strong arm their way into getting what they want through their lobbyists and through their political hacks that they have in Washington. So it's, it's shocking how few, I don't think people realize there's like six companies that own everything. They own the media, they own the banks, they own, and people think it's all separate, you know what I mean? And it's like, why does, it, why does the media always say the same thing? Everybody's saying the same thing. It's all comes, it comes from one exact source. And who owns that source? One of six companies. You that's got it. Extraordinary. That, it really that's extraordinary. is. People don't appreciate, you know, they think, you know, they can depend on their press and the, the mainstream media. And I heard it on NBC. And no, you heard it from the bank that owns the company that, wants it to say what I <laughs> want you to hear. That, that's, to that's, so, that's such an important point you make, Michelle. And that's one of the things we teach uh, our trading community here at followthemoney.com and also investors in general is that, that uh, most news is simply press releases, right? They're just press releases. And so uh, if you allow your day to be guided by press releases, then you're doing exactly what they want you to do. Uh, so I find it very freeing and liberating to turn the media off, to turn the noise off. And you say, well, how are you going to know what's going to happen? How do you know what's going on in the world? Well, 
I mean, you can strategically do this. You can use Google News Alerts, for example, to be alerted on certain specific things that you want to know about that might, you know, it might. But you can also, if you're a trader or you're an investor, what we teach people to do is look at the chart. Look at the chart of the S&P 500. You'll know what the news is. Uh, you'll, you'll know what the real news is, right? You could, because that's a, that's a mirror or a picture. The chart of the S&P 500 or the chart of the NASDAQ or the chart of the Dow Dow Jones is really a picture of investor expectations. And so if something's really bothersome to the investors, you're going to see it on that chart. Uh, if it's not really worrying them, then you're just, then you, then you yourself are just getting worried and entangled up in all of these press releases for no reason because the investors are not. So from an investment standpoint or a trading standpoint, you know, the news oftentimes is really pretty worthless. Uh, it's, it's really the, the chart that tells the story, the price, the volume. Exactly. Now, Jerry, do you think that cryptocurrencies present a viable solution to government issued currency? I'm, uh, oh, that's a good question. I, I began buying cryptocurrencies, uh, back in 20, 2013, 2012 or 2013, I had a good friend of mine who came on our podcast, on the Fallen Money podcast. His name was Trace Mayer. He was one of the very first adopters. He bought in 2011 around 25 cents in Bitcoin. And of course, he accumulated uh, at very low prices. Uh, he told me about Bitcoin at the time. I was still new to the, th the whole thing. I, I looked at it. I thought, this looks fairly interesting. I threw a little bit of money at it but back then and slowly began building a, a core position in crypto. So currently, uh, 5% of my total investable assets I have allocated towards cryptocurrencies. And that's all. I mean, I'm not going to put any more unless, unless things start to change. But I've, I've been remaining at 5% of my total investable assets exposed to cryptocurrencies since about 20, probably about 2014. And I've seen the yo-yo know, the, the yo -yo markets. I mean, very, very crazy. Uh, do they present a viable replacement? for the existing fiat currencies that exist. I think that they, ha they present, I, I think they provide us with uh, something that's unique in the fact that they're finite. Uh, you cannot print more Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin will max out at some time around the year 2140 with a maximum supply of 21 million Bitcoin. Uh, there's something appealing about that. There's something appealing about knowing that there is a finite number of units that you're using for something called money. That's, that was the benefit of the gold standard is that you had to go dig up more gold if you wanted to print more money. Or in the case of the conquistadors, you know, you had to go sail across the open sea and go rob people of their gold. If, <laughs> if, you, wanted to, go yeah, <laughs> if, if you wanted to create more money because you had to have gold to back up the money. But we live in a day now, of course, where the Federal Reserve just prints it out of thin air. There is nothing backing it up. So crypto is really challenge this fiat monetary system with its uh, fractional reserve banking and it's creating money out of thin air. It really challenges uh, the this, this system. So cryptocurrencies, they challenge the system. But again, I think also there's a brewing global battle over, over uh, the whole blockchain technology because blockchain technology creates transparency. It forces accountability. Uh, it makes it very difficult to, to, uh, to operate the kind of scams that our current monetary authorities do. Uh, it makes it very difficult to hide the kickbacks and everything else that they do. So I would say that it's a wonderful system on paper. Uh, it's, it's actually turned out to be a very wonderful system in practice in the fact that it's very accountable and, and, and it does seem very uh, uh, sustainable for the long term if we can all begin to use these cryptocurrencies. But I would say that the, the powers that be uh, have a terribly vested interest, a strong vested interest in keeping the system as it is. And so uh, I would expect its adoption to be slow. Uh, I would expect its adoption uh, globally to be fought. Uh, and I would expect possibly for the price volatility to be so extreme, you know, for many years still, while the uncertainty of this system is being worked out. But but I, I think I probably want to add one thing to that comment, and that is simply this, that in the end, really all you have with Bitcoin is something that everyone is agreeing on, right? It's, it doesn't really have any intrinsic value. And I know some people will fight and, and they will try to act as if these ones and zeros and, and computers have intrinsic value. But, but a piece of gold 
uh, has been money for 5,000, 6,000 years. People, when they see gold, when they feel gold, when they touch gold, when they know, they know it's money. Cryptocurrencies, even though I own them, I don't own more of them than I own of gold because I understand that in the conscious of man, man runs to gold historically. Does he run to cryptos? We'll see. We'll see if he runs to cryptos when we have the next major you know, market collapse. It may. It may be uh, because these can't be printed and they can't be manipulated, uh, so to speak, uh, if they're properly set up. So uh, I would say that I have... I have uh, high hopes for cryptocurrencies going forward, that I own them, that I have a diversified portfolio of about 10 or 12 cryptocurrencies that I really, really like and that we share with our members, we share our portfolio, we talk. And I think you're going to see some really crazy gains on the next rally because we've come back so low. But I don't have more faith in cryptocurrencies than I do in a simple gold coin. I think in the end, man, mankind tends to he tends to think a little more highly of himself than he should, and he thinks a lot of his technology. But when the lights go out or we have a problem with the, you know, with the uh, electric grid or whatever, you're going to find out that people would rather have a piece of silver than some you know, token that is Ill- in unusable all of a sudden or becomes, in a way, cumbersome to use, whereas you know, gold and silver have always been used, have used as money. So while I am hopeful for cryptos, and I think they provide a fantastic challenge to the, to the corrupt systems that we have today. I think that a gold-backed kind of cryptocurrency would probably be my, my favorite kind of crypto. Mm, always back to the gold. Mm-hmm. Now, Jerry, turning now to the stock market, are we in a bear market or nearing one? Because J.P. Morgan analysts are very bullish while on the other side of things, Bank of America's analysts are bearish for the first half of 2019. Then following that, they predict one last hurrah before we completely roll over into a bear market. What are your thoughts? Well, I would say those guys are smarter than me. I would say that uh, if they know where things are going to be three months from now or you know a year from now, they're, they're brilliant. Uh, my, my, <laughs> my crystal ball is broken. I, I, I gave it up a long time ago. But I, but I will say this. We follow trends. And if you look at the trends, what you'll notice is that we entered a new long-term uptrend. We alerted all of our members of a new long-term uptrend. Well, before actually we, we uh, updated our members before they were actually members of our website. We, our, our organization has grown over the years. But before we started our website, we actually alerted those members that we had of what was happening in the market. And we, uh, we were able to get out of the market in 2007. Our system said, it's time to sell. Uh, that was at the very end of 2007. It was incredible timing. Uh, and then we, our system said to get back in at about June or July, kind of the summertime of 2009, when everybody was still pretty spooked. Now, our system still shows that we're in a long-term uptrend right now. So as far as it being a bear market, you know, I would prefer to use the language perhaps downtrend or uptrend. And I would say on a long-term basis, we're still in, a, in an uptrend if you look at the chart. But like you said earlier, we are nearing a new downtrend. And so uh, we're going to alert our members whenever that happens. We send out email alerts you know, when that major trend changes. And it doesn't change too often. But when it changes, it's a big deal. So right now, we would say that we are in a, uh, still in a long-term uptrend. That long-term uptrend is weakening right now, and that um, if it does turn into a new long-term downtrend, that we could see a lot of pain. Uh, We think that the 2008 crash um, will be smaller uh, percentage-wise than what we are going to see in the next major crash. So we we realize that we are now in this boom-bust cycle created by the central banking schemes. And this is how things work. They jack rates up and pop the bubble. And then they lower rates and create the bubble. And then they jack rates back up and destroy the bubble. And this is where we are. So, uh, so right now, we're kind of you know, nearing perhaps a new long-term downtrend, but we're not there yet. Uh, things could still change. Things could still uh, develop where we could see more upside from this market before it's finally over, but it will be over because we do move through a boom bust cycle. 
in preparation for that, what are some of the best bear market strategies? Our favorite um, would be buying puts. I'll, I'll give you a few. Buying okay. puts on uh, ridiculously overvalued stocks, right? So buying puts using the options market. Another strategy that I think is a little more intuitive for most people is to use inverse ETFs. So ETFs are to simply exchange traded funds. They're like a mutual fund, except they trade like a stock uh, throughout the day. So you can actually trade them. And exchange traded funds come in a few different flavors, several different flavors for that matter. So you could buy an ETF that tracks the S&P 500. So you could say, I want to, if the S&P 500 goes up 1%, I want to enjoy that ride. And so you could buy an ETF that's for the S&P 500. Or, this is pretty cool, you could buy the inverse of the S&P 500. So if you thought that the S&P 500 was not going to go up but go down, then you could buy an ETF that goes up 1% when the S&P 500 goes down. Or when the NASDAQ goes up 1%, your ETF would you know, go down. Or if it wow. Would, you know, it's inverse. You know, it goes yeah. back and forth. So, so we love inverse ETFs. And then on top of those, for those who are more aggressive, they have leveraged inverse ETFs. So in other words, there's uh, ones that I like to trade, for example, like the uh, short NASDAQ has been a particular winner for us. The short um, semiconductor space has been a really good one for us lately. But SOXS, I'm just giving out tickers so they know how they can find these. I'm not recommending them at all. I'm just telling them what I personally trade. But SOS, SOSX and SQQQ, those two, for example, which we've been writing, give you, give you triple leverage. So if the market uh, falls by 1%, if the S&P falls by 1%, then your, then your 3X ETF inverse is going to go up 3%. Uh, if the NASDAQ falls by 1%, then these inverse 3X ETFs go up by 3%. So it's a really powerful way to profit from a downtrend. And quite frankly, the majority of the money that's made in the market is made in the downtrend. Uh, we think of guys like Jesse Livermore, who made one, the equivalent of $1 billion in the 1929 crash. He made $100 million by shorting the market because the market oftentimes takes the stairs up and then it takes the elevator down, right? So <laughs> and, and it happens real fast. And so Everybody says there's a lot of money to be made when you know, things are falling <laughs> apart. So it's sure. something to watch. Wow. Yeah. So, so I would say put options, uh, inverse ETFs. Uh, those would be two of my favorites. I prefer really not to just straight up short stocks because there is quite a bit of uh, risk with that. But I really prefer put options if I want to short a stock and inverse ETFs. So I would just leave it at that. Jerry, this has been an amazing interview. I want to thank you so much for coming on. Tell everyone how they can follow your work because it is extraordinary. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. Uh, so our website is followthemoney.com. Uh, as you mentioned at the outset, I'm an economist. I'm a trader. I'm an author of the book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation, and I like to help people. I have a heart of a teacher, and so I, when, when people become members of our website, I like to teach them how to get themselves ahead. I like to, it's just a burden that I have. I want to see as many people set free financially as possible. I want to see them uh, pursuing their calling, whatever it is that they might be called to do. Everybody has a special calling that they're called to do. I want to see them fulfill that calling, and sometimes we, we, you end up in, in life where you know, you've got a, a job that is just taking so much of your time, or maybe you've got a, other obligations that are just, you know, maybe life just isn't working out the way that you had hoped it to. And at Follow the Money, we try to sh give you step-by-step -step ways of how you can kind of reclaim that back and how you can move back into a place of having financial freedom. And sometimes it just comes through simplification. But our website, followthemoney.com, people can go there. They can become a free member. We have a bronze membership. They can kind of check us out and see what we're all about. But uh, you can go there. But we also have paid memberships as well. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on YouTube. We have a, a thriving YouTube page and Twitter page and Facebook page. Well, we're everywhere. Just uh, followthemoney.com is the, probably the starting place to go. Extraordinary. Well, this has been wonderful. Thank you again so much for coming on the show. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Michelle. It was an honor. Mr. Jerry Robinson, the founder of followthemoney.com and whose extraordinary achievements are profiled in our exclusive report at portfoliowealthglobal.com slash Jerry. For the industry experts panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at portfoliowealthglobal.com.